All right, another important point. So we should do the reverse on that one. Uh, we'll, we'll do it if we have time, but I don't think we'll have time yeah. for that. It's, all, it's in the handout, by the way. Okay. Um, but before we go on, what about if I had just given you these reagents? What if instead of drawing the two aldehydes, I'd only drawn one and asked for the product? Well, the answer would be it would be the same exact product. Because remember, it's not like there's only one molecule in solution. Even if you only draw one of these, there's really billions of these. So you can, it's still perfectly permissible to say that we can form pairs like this where some of them get enolized and some don't, and some attack the other ones. And there's, certain, there's not even any need to say that we have two equivalents of this. We don't need to say we have two equivalents. Um, even if we don't, uh, that, that's really uh, irrelevant. We know that we have billions of these aldehyde molecules, so we can expect that some of them can attack other ones. Only if there's a base present. That's right, if we have that base. Okay. So generally speaking, they're, um, they're not going to make it so easy for you by drawing two separate versions of the same aldehyde. They'll simply draw one aldehyde and put in the base, and you're expected then to draw on your own the two separate versions and show that some of them are attacking the other ones. Uh, going back to the retro alcohol condensation, what would we have to do to this to make it go backwards? And the answer is just add heat. Just add heat. We don't even have to add the carbonyl oxygen because the carbonyl oxygen is still here. right? The carbonyl oxygen is still here. All you have to do is just add heat to this. So if you see a beta hydroxy aldehyde and heat, you expect that to do the retro aldehyde condensation. Really? Really. How, like how would you so show the mechanism though if it's just heat? Well, you would just reverse these steps. So you would still be doing this under uh, so basic be, conditions. Oh, okay. So, um, note, so the first thing you would do is you would deprotonate this oxygen using the base. Um, that would take us back to here. So actually, maybe, uh, I guess you still do need to do the base catalyst. Yeah. I should have said heat and the base catalyst, although I'm not sure if they actually even always show the catalyst. Um, but I suppose that technically you do need that base so catalyst still. The proton right. But uh, if I remember correctly, sometimes people are sloppy and they don't even show the catalyst. They just show the heat. But yeah, it seems like you need a catalyst to take this proton to get us back to here, and then we just reverse each of these steps. Okay. Uh, all right, so this would be a, a typical category one type reaction. It just seems more complicated because the nucleophile is more complicated. It's this complicated alpha carbon situation that we have going on over here. Okay, well, uh, now we can ask what would happen if we had heat. Well, if we had heat, we would just keep blasting through this point. Um, remember, which category are we gonna be in here? Category three. Right. Uh, now, category three is when the same nucleophilic atom attacks twice. Well, who was the nucleophilic atom in this problem? The alpha carbon. The alpha carbon. That's right. Well, what needs to happen in order for this to be a nucleophile and attack a second time? Steal another H. That's right. So there's going to be a proton transfer from the hydroxy. From this over here? Now, let's see. Turns out that that's not the conventional way to draw this. This just gained the hydrogen in the first place. Instead, how do, how do so we need to turn this into an enolate again? Well, how do we turn something into an enolate? Well, we use our base that we just regenerated in this step over here. Remember that oh. in this step we regenerated the base catalyst. So now we can just do this first step all over again, where the base takes the alpha hydrogen over here. So we can use the base that we just uh, regenerated. Just take the proton from here. Mm -hmm. No, no, no. Why doesn't the OH from there take the proton? This one? Yeah. Well, for one thing, it, it just got finished giving the proton to here. Remember that in this step, the water was putting the proton on this oxygen. No, I mean that um, hydroxy. This hydroxy group, mm -hmm. why doesn't this steal the hydrogen from here? Well, hydrogen? first of all, this is uh, this is not this doesn't have a charge yet, and this does have a charge. Okay. So this is not really very reactive at this point. But doesn't it do it in other problems that we've done? It, it this could take a proton from an acid, but it's not going to take a proton. So, so it could take a proton from a hydronium, say, but it's not going to take a proton from somebody that's neutral. 
So yeah, it's true that sometimes you ha you can protonate hydroxyoxygen. So for example, it's not going to take it from a carbon, but it will yeah. take it from like an NH plus. Oh okay. Okay, so it doesn't matter that the hydroxy group is in charge. It matters that the carbon is in charge. Uh, I guess both of those. Um, are the key things here. So no, because we've had a hydroxy groups that steal yeah. H's but without being charged. Uh, let's see. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, sometimes we have seen that. Another uh, another reason not to do that, so maybe here's the best reason. This, that, that's actually a good question. So that, that's good that they came up. If this hydroxy had stolen this proton, it would end up with a positive charge, right? However, this is a very important point. Under basic conditions, you should not form positive intermediates. Under basic conditions, you almost never form a positive intermediate because the base keeps things either neutral or negative. When you're under basic conditions, the base will tend to keep things either negative or at least neutral. You're almost never going to form a positive intermediate. So that actually is a, a very good point. That's a common mistake that people make. Under basic conditions, you should try to keep your intermediates neutral or negative. And the flip side is, under acidic conditions, you should try to keep your intermediates neutral or positive. Um, so in this case, it wouldn't make sense for this oxygen to, to steal this proton because then it would end up positive, which is not consistent with our basic conditions. Okay, okay so that, that was a good point. However, it's perfectly plausible for this guy to steal the hydrogen because then it just ends up neutral. It's okay for this to end up neutral over here. Okay. Um, all right, so that puts this negative charge here. What would be a logical next step? Um, the negative charge makes a double bond. Yeah, that is exactly what happens. And this is like the weird times when OH is a good leaving group. That's good. Yeah, that's what I was just We've got it. That, that, that's a good, that's well put. This is one of the weird times where a neutral oxygen is a leaving group. It's got to leave simultaneously now because otherwise we'd break the octet. We've done that since before. Yeah, exactly. Pardon? Like I had done it before when you I still did it H. This moves over and making this go over. That's right. Actually, that is the way the second language book draws it, but it's not the way your textbook draws it. Your textbook draws oh, this okay. as two separate steps, so I think it's going to be safer to draw it as two separate steps. I think that's more accurate to draw it as two separate steps at this point. Um, also, I, I think it, it makes it easier to think through the steps. It makes the, fir the first half more similar to the second. First, we form the enolate, then the enolate attacks. That seems more logical. Just like in the beginning, first we formed an enolate, and then it attacked. Well, here we're forming the enolate, and then that's attacking. All right, and now here's where I think it's really crucial that we keep putting in our asterisks and our alphas so that we can see what's happened here. This carbon used to be the carbonyl carbon. It doesn't look anything like a carbonyl anymore, so it's important to put this asterisk in so we can remember that it used to be the carbonyl carbon. This is the alpha carbon that's been the nucleophile all the time. And I'm asterisking this oxygen because this used to be the carbonyl oxygen, but now it's left. So putting in these asterisks and alphas, I think, can be real helpful here. And again, I like to kind of show the nucleophile in this, in this type of reaction coming in from above, so it matches the patterns we've seen before. This really doesn't match our chapter 17 reactions. It's just that the nucleophile is more complicated, so it's easier to get confused. But if we keep labeling the alpha carbon, it, we're less likely to get confused uh, about that. All right, and that gives us our final product here. So notice the basic pattern is uh, under cold conditions, first we form the enolate, and then the enolate does a nucleophilic attack. And under hot conditions, then we form another enolate, and the enolate does another nucleophilic attack. So form the enolate, nucleophilic attack. Form the enolate, nucleophilic attack. We use the base to form the enolate, and then it does the nucleophilic attack on the asterisk carbon, the carbonyl carbon. Uh, and we, we are drawing those two separate steps. All right, so that gives us this product here. Uh, and again, this is a case where it might also be very helpful to put in numbers to make sure that you're not adding or dropping carbons. But I, and oftentimes, the asterisks and the alphas just do it for us. So we need to stop and talk about this for a second. We need a good name for this type of compound. Uh, and here's where that alpha-beta idea comes in. I think your instructor might have called this an alpha-beta unsaturated yeah. aldehyde or keto. Wait, is the, this reversible also or only yes. after the cold part? Yeah, that's a good question. We can talk about that in a second, too. Yeah, so I've been using equilibrium arrows all along the way. This is also reversible. So we'll talk about that more in a second. But first of all, the name for this would be an alpha, beta, unsaturated aldehyde. 
kind of makes sense because there's the alpha carbon, and then there on the beta, there's an aldehyde. What was that? From the beta, like it had the aldehyde. Right. Now, actually, that's not really where this name is coming from. What does unsaturated mean? Not fully, like... The technical meaning in OCHEM is a double bond. Yeah. Unsaturated means double or triple bonds. This is called alpha-beta unsaturated because the double bond is between the alpha and the beta carbons. Yeah. It has nothing to do with the aldehyde over here. It's called alpha-beta unsaturated to indicate that the double bond is between the alpha and the beta carbons. So we, we know that unsaturated means a double bond, or maybe a triple bond. But in this case, it means a double bond. 